This is a recording for your notes on bacteria. So today we're going to talk about the two groups of bacteria, your archaeobacteria and your eubacteria together. Uh, first, let's remember that the archaeobacteria belong to the domain archaea and is the only kingdom there. And then let's remember that the kingdom eubacteria that we will talk next belongs to its own domain, the domain bacteria. And the other domain that we have, of course, is the domain, domain eukarya that includes all the uh, organisms with eukaryotic cells. Just a quick refresher. So as we go through this, again, the, the focus is on remembering uh, certain characteristics of the organisms and their significance and try to put together what we have studied before with these organisms. And so I'm going to try to do both things at the same time. So if we focus on the kingdom Archaeobacteria, uh, we just historically, we just call this bacteria because with the naked eye and even with a regular microscope, we cannot tell the two groups apart. Like all bacteria, of course, they are going to be unicellular and, of course, they are all prokaryotic in structure. Remember, prokaryotic means that you have a cell membrane, you have a cell wall, you have a piece of circular DNA, only one molecule of DNA, you have ribosomes, of course, to make proteins, and of course, everything else is uh, in the cytoplasm dissolved. Okay, so given that, one significant aspect of the archaeobacteria is that their cell wall, their cell wall, does not have this compound called peptidoglycan, and that is the big difference between the two groups of bacteria. That's why it's in bolded and in red right now, so you remember. Now. These bacteria can be motile. Motile means that they can move or non-motile. That means they do not move. If they move, motile means that they move, the bacteria are going to have flagella. Flagella. If you review your types of cells from the beginning of the year, you'll remember that we have flagella and cilia as structures. So if you are motile, you are going to move using flagella. They, they move them and they can swim. Now, the other important thing is that these organisms can be autotroph. Auto means that they make their own food. So basically something like photosynthesis. There is another mechanism that they can use and it's called chemosynthesis. And I need you to add it chemosynthesis. Basically, it's very similar to photosynthesis, but they make molecules using inorganic compounds. So in chemosynthesis, they make their own food, may they make their own food, but using inorganic molecules. Not everybody can do this. This is a very special type of autotroph. So the autotroph can be of two types. They can be doing chemosynthesis or of course they can be doing photosynthesis and you know that these make their own food using the energy from the sun. Uh, of course they can also be heterotrophs, that means that they need to ingest organic materials, organic molecules from other organisms. Okay? Uh, within this group, they are always going to live in extreme environments. These are really nasty places to live. And so you're going to see them always with funny names. For example, methanogens, they make Methane, methane is CH4, it's an organic molecule and this is a gas. 
and this is actually the gas that many cows and even humans sometimes we pass. Halophiles, halo means salt, files means to love, they live in very salty place, places like for example the Dead Sea that is an extremely salty place or even in what we call salt mines you have this bacteria growing in the salt and of course from our previous unit you must recall that these were the first organisms on earth now these are typical of again extreme environments and these resemble the early earth atmosphere uh, conditions remember nothing was very pretty at the beginning so they live in salty pools like the Dead Sea as I mentioned before or the Great Salt Lake that is located in Utah in the United States extremely salty places where nothing else can survive because it's too salty and if you recall when something is too salty osmosis happens and you lose your water but these bacteria have the capacity to tolerate that and they do not lose their water they also live in very hot places like volcanic hot springs and geysers like those that you might see in Yellowstone National Park if you are not familiar with some of these I encourage you to do Google Google images for any of these places they also live in really drastic places that have absolutely no oxygen so they are in places without oxygen like if you have ever seen a swamp the soil in the swamps is really black and smells bad well that black organic mud has no oxygen and that's where you find this kind of bacteria and finally another interesting place is the stomach of animals that we call ruminants these are your cows, deer, basically animals that have to chew and then bring the food back and then keep on chewing it and this in the stomach of this in the digestive system of the ruminants these bacteria produce methane and the methane is released by the cows CH4 into the atmosphere and unfortunately this is what we call a greenhouse gas meaning greenhouse gas that contributes to the greenhouse to the warming of the planet uh, methane is very similar in effects in the atmosphere to CO2 it retains heat and causes uh, warming of the planet so here you have a picture of the met methanogens in the stomach of ruminants those are the bacteria it, of course this is an electron micrograph regular microscopes do not work you also find archaeobacteria in the deep ocean vents this is very deep on the ocean uh, you might want to look at a video on google of this and you can see spewing out there gases and hot water and all around the bacteria these archaeobacteria are living there so main thing they do not have peptidoglycan and they really like to live in extreme environments finally we have the other group of bacteria again is the kingdom eubacteria and again they are prokaryotes they have prokaryotic cells everything is exactly the same technically but here these have this compound in their cell membrane pept in the cell, cell wall excuse me peptidoglycan and if you recall peptido this means that is a protein and glycan that means that this is a carbohydrate it's a molecule that has both they can be autotrophs that means that they do photosynthesis in this case photosynthesis and we call this blue green algae or I need you to write this other name cyanobacteria cyanobacteria 
And we talked about this in evolution because these are the first organisms that started doing photosynthesis on planet Earth. So blue-green algae or cyanobacteria are the same. This is the preferred name. We are trying to get away from this name that can be confusing. So cyanobacteria, try to remember that name. Of course, they can also be heterotroph eating other things. Again, some are motile, that means that they move using flagella, flagella, or some of them spin. They just have a, mo a spinning motion and they can move, like swimming like a dolphin kind of thing. If they are non-motile, of course, they do not move. Who are these? These are some examples of the bacteria that we have around us. Some are really good that we really love and some are not so good. So, for example, Streptococcus pyogenes. This is the one that causes strep throat. If you have ever had strep throat, very painful, this is the bacteria that causes strep throat. E. coli, they live in our large intestine and this is very good for us. It helps us make a lot of molecules that our body needs, like vitamin K. So we like our E. coli in our intestine. They live in the large intestine in our colon. Lactobacillus acidophilus. This is the one that actually does lactic acid fermentation and is the one that is used to make yogurt and sour cream. So this is a very useful bacteria too. Finally, another example, Salmonella enteritidis. This is the one that you find in poultry, basically chicken eggs or chicken. And if it's not well cooked, this bacteria might be on the surface. And if you eat it, and you get it, it causes a lot of intestinal problems. It's called food poisoning. All right. So you have a few examples of bacteria there. Just a quick, please remember that these are beautifully idealized pictures of your bacteria, showing all th things that are in there, but it can be as simple as a membrane and a cell wall and DNA, ribosomes, and a couple of flagella. So don't be fooled by all these other things, just it can be very simple. Since we are talking about you bacteria, it's of note that the cell wall has this compound that we call peptidoglycan. And that's the one big difference with the other bacteria, the archaeobacteria. So I have there a nice table that you can take some time to compare. And this is what I want you to try to do. Find patterns and spend time thinking about it and try to put an image in your head so you can associate words with images. Now, bacteria come in many different shapes, actually just three shapes and the shapes have names. So some are round. If you look at this one, here is a round one, round, round. This shape is called coccus. Coccus. Think of a coconut, round. So this is the coccus bacteria. And notice each one of these is one cell. Bacteria like to get together. Bacteria are sticky. They like to stick together. So notice that all these bacteria are kind of sticking together. Still, each one is an independent cell, but they like to stick together. So an example of this bacteria that has the coccus shape is Streptococcus pyogenes, the one that causes strep throat. And of course, you can see here that in the name, it tells you what the shape is. The other shape that we have is called a bacillus shape and these are rods. They are like little rectangles. Try to draw this. Cocos is a circle. If you draw them, it helps you remember. And right here, just like before, they like to stick together. So here we have one bacteria here, 
two bacteria there, three bacteria there, you can see how they are sticking together. Now, an example of this is Bacillus anthracis. Notice that the name is the same name as the genus. The shape is used to describe the genus. Finally, there is another type of shape called spirillum and the bacteria are like a little spirals. They are little curlicues, like spir spirals. You can see them here, they look like mini snakes. And an example of this is spirillum, spirillum volutans. Again, you have to recognize the three shapes of bacteria. How do the bacteria reproduce? Well, they reproduce sexually and asexually two ways. So one interesting thing is that there are some bacteria, especially E. coli, that can divide every 20 minutes. Think about how fast that is. So the type of asexual reproduction that they have is called binary fission. Basically what happens there, the cell divides into two the cell divides into two. Very, pretty much very similar to what we see in mitosis. So yes, they have to copy their circular DNA, they copy their circular DNA, and then they separate it. One for one cell, one for the other cell. So both cells end up with the same DNA. And of course, since this is just copy and divide, copy and divide, both cells are identical. Both cells are identical and they are technically clones. Okay, So this type of reproduction that we call asexual, is called binary fission, involves the same process. Copy and divide, copy and divide. But since that kind of reproduction doesn't convey or doesn't provide any genetic diversity because all of them are the same, bacteria can also have some type of something very similar to sexual reproduction and that is called conjugation. 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 And what happens here? If you look at this picture here or this one, here is a bacteria here is another bacteria and they create a, like a little tunnel, a little tube using their cell membrane and then what they do is they exchange DNA through this tube. You send to the other one, the other one sends to the other one. So they can exchange some genetic material by connecting with each other through this bridge. And the name of the bridge is pili, if you want to know that. So here I have three bacteria and now the three of them are connecting. And basically they are all exchanging genetic material. So basically by doing this they are increasing their genetic diversity because remember that when they do binary fission they turned out just being identical and all identical is not good for survival. So conjugation increases their genetic diversity. Now bacteria are probably the most important creatures on the planet. Probably the most important creatures in the planet and we, most people don't know that because we focus on the negative. We focus on the bad bacteria. But there are more good bacteria <coughs> than anything else. So a few examples of this because we need to appreciate them and we need to know this. One of the good things that bacteria do, they are what we call decomposers. What do decomposers do? They break down organic compounds, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, they broken down into their simpler, smaller molecules like amino acids, simple glucose, fatty acids, nucleotides, so they break it down. Now, decomposers, so what the bacteria do, 
if you have something that has died so you have and you know that this happens when anything dies so you have an organism that is dead here and of course the organism is made out of protein, carbohydrates, lipids and nucleic acids what the bacteria do is they start using all these molecules and breaking them down into the simpler molecules amino acids, glucose, fatty acids so they start dissolving the organism and of course and let's add nucleotides and when the bacteria start dissolving breaking down this organism that is made out of these big molecules some of these are used by the bacteria used by bacteria to build more bacteria you know if you want to reproduce you need all these molecules so the bacteria break down the big organisms that die and they use their basic molecules for themselves the glucose as a source of energy for cellular respiration and all the molecules to build more membranes to build more structures more DNA so as we owe them a lot because if we didn't have this bacteria everything that dies would be remain dead all over the place and if you have noticed if you have seen anything that has died usually breaks down decomposes smells really bad well those are the bacteria breaking it down they are so good at breaking down things that we use them in the water treatment plants to process the water and break down all that organic matter that we poop and send down the toilet and the waste treat, uh, the water treatment plants use this bacteria to break all this down into the basic molecules and at the end you end up with clean water because the bacteria use all the organic stuff that comes out in your fecal material so decomposers you really need to know about decomposers so please review it and ask me questions in class if you need to the second job that they do is something called nitrogen fixation very important process as you know plants from before we know this plants the roots of plants need to take from the soil nitrogen phosphate and potassium those are the three main things that plant roots need to pick up from the soil and this is also what we find in fertilizer and we know the nitrogen is going to be used to make proteins and nitrogen bases the phosphate is going to be used to make ATP and nitrogen bases and the potassium is used for many other things that we didn't discuss in this class the problem that we have with nitrogen is that the soil has very little nitrogen most of the nitrogen is in the air in the form of nitrogen gas most of the nitrogen is in the air in the form of nitrogen gas and the plants cannot use this nitrogen the plants cannot use nitrogen gas the only thing that the plants can use is a molecule called ammonia 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 so how do the plants get this nitrogen get this ammonia in the roots well there are bacteria that convert nitrogen gas into ammonia there are bacteria that live in the soil of course bacteria that live in the soil that can grab this nitrogen gas and make it into ammonia and then this ammonia can be used by the plants so we need this nitrogen fixing bacteria that's what we call this process nitrogen fixation from nitrogen gas to ammonia so we have this bacteria we, 
if you are in class I will help you visualize this I'm gonna look here for example these bacteria many of these bacteria that do this nitrogen fixation live in the roots of some plants that we call legumes for the record those are all the beans they also in clover so if you look at the roots of the plant you, you see these little circles here these little circles that's where the bacteria lives bacteria lives there and these bacteria are grabbing nitrogen gas from the air and transforming it into ammonia that they are sharing with the plant nice job so if you open one of these little balls that you see there and you look inside this is what you're gonna see notice these are all bacteria and these are all bacteria of the bacillus shape notice you can see them all there packed of bacteria there so this is a great service that plants do for us and I'll tell you some more about it in class finally uh, this is more of a review we have talked about many food products that are made with bacteria or by bacteria that carry fermentation in this case lactic acid fermentation if you need to review your cellular respiration please do so bacteria that do lactic acid fermentation of course they use glucose the sugar for energy but instead of breaking the sugars into co2 and water all the way down they only break them down into a molecule of lactic acid that as an acid has a low ph and this low ph basically causes the milk to change and the proteins in the milk to change and that's how you end up with yogurt yogurt is basically denatured proteins in the milk and of course those proteins denatured because of the low ph of the lactic acid if you like pickles you know pickles are also kind of sour again is due to the production of lactic acid and kimchi if you eat kimchi this is cabbage basically and the bacteria use the sugars in the cabbage to produce lactic acid and the cabbage the proteins in the cabbage denature change its texture and that is kimchi so nice process and helps us review a lot of the things that we studied at the beginning of the year here you have a nice lactobacillus acidophilus this is the bacteria that is in yogurt actually when you eat yogurt you are eating this bacteria and if here are the bacteria and as you can see they are the rod shape so they are bacillus shape just like the name tells you remember that they like to join head to head so you have several lactobacillus acidophilus together there so next time that you eat yogurt if you eat yogurt think about it you are eating bacteria finally autotrophs these are what we call cyanobacteria cyanobacteria uh, blue green algae is the name that we are trying to eliminate because it's not very accurate cyanobacteria and of course these are bacteria that can do photosynthesis and please recall the equation for photosynthesis you need water co2 and sunlight and in the process you produce oxygen and sugars more specifically glucose you have some pictures here again 
This one, for example, you have one, two, three, four there. Remember that these like to aggregate. This looks like a string. Each one of them is a cell. So many, many thousands of cells together. And please remember these were the first cells on planet Earth to do photosynthesis. And they are the ones that created the oxygen that is in our atmosphere. Of course, most people remember bacteria because of the bad stuff and those are the bacterial diseases that they cause. And you might wonder, well, how do they make you sick? What do the bacteria actually do in your body that makes you sick? Well, there are two things that they do to make us feel bad. One of the things they do is they damage the cells. Basically, they eat your cells. They break down your cells and use them for food. So basically they are eating you alive. And a good example of this is Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the bacteria that causes tuberculosis in your lungs. Basically they destroy your lungs. They are eating you alive. The other way that seems to be more common, more, more bacteria do this, the bacteria release toxins poisons into your body and those molecules are toxic they travel through your body of course in the bloodstream and those molecules disrupt your normal activities of the cells so the cells cannot work properly because of these toxins that are traveling through your body and of course these toxic molecules basically they are poisoning you cause a number of uh, symptoms in the case of Streptococcus pyogenes that causes strep throat and here you can see a mouth those are the teeth that's the throat up there all that white stuff there in the back of the throat those are bacteria growing there in the throat and producing toxins that cause fever body aches a very painful sore throat a normal throat does not have those white plaques. So that's one of the ways you can do to figure out if you have strep throat. Just open your mouth, look in the mirror and see what you get. I have a couple of uh, a nice table here with a couple of diseases and the name of the bacteria. You do not need to remember this, but I want to point something out. The first one, tooth decay. This is what we call cavities. They are caused by bacteria. Basically, when you do not brush, you leave food, especially glucose, right there in between the teeth. The bacteria are going to use the glucose as a source of energy and especially if they are anaerobic they are gonna produce lactic acid and of course it's an acid and this acid is the one that starts breaking down your teeth and producing the cavities so it's not the bacteria itself but it's the waste product of the bacteria that causes the cavities that's why it's very important to brush your teeth so you get rid of those bacteria as much as possible but mostly so you get rid of all food that is stuck in between your teeth. How do we prevent or cure any of these bacterial diseases since everybody is so concerned about them? Well, if you want to prevent them, basically don't get those diseases, the main source that we have are vaccines. And remember that vaccines, what we do when you get a shot, that's what people call them, I'm getting a shot. Basically, you are given to your body either dead, killed or very weakened bacteria that cannot reproduce or cause damage. That's what you get in the shot. And then that teaches your body, teaches your immune system what this pathogen looks like. And your body is gonna make antibodies. These are nice proteins 
that are gonna defend you against the real bacteria if they ever get in. So basically with the vaccines you make all your defenses, basically it's like you prepare and as soon as the real bacteria gets in, boom, they attack them and destroy it. These antibodies attack and destroy the new bacteria. Now, how can we cure? Let's say you're oh, too bad, you got something, you got strep throat, we don't have a vaccine against strep throat, how am I going to get better? Well, one way is to just wait until your body's immune system fights it, which might take a while and you might feel sick for a while and nobody likes to feel sick. So what we have done is we have discovered this other type of molecules that we call antibiotics. These are chemical compounds, it's all chemistry here, that are gonna either kill the bacteria, basically kill them for real, or sometimes they prevent them from reproducing. So once they are inside, they cannot make any more bacteria and your immune system can get rid of them. Something important to know is that antibiotics only work on bacteria. Antibiotics do not kill anything else. They do not kill viruses, they do not kill fungi, they do not kill protista. Antibiotics only kill bacteria. And you might be familiar with some of the antibiotics that are more common, penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin. You might have taken some of these uh, if you have ever gotten a bacterial infection. Last piece of information that we need to know, can we control bacteria growth? We want the good ones in our body. Go, keep on growing. But the bad ones, we want to keep them at bay. So how do we control bacterial growth? Number one, we use disinfectants. These are chemical solutions, compounds, basically that kill pathogens, usually by destroying their cell wall or destroying their membrane. And you are familiar with Lysol, regular soap, regular soap dissolves their membranes. Alcohol or iodine. Iodine is that yellow uh, substance that you put on your skin that makes it yellow and is a very good disinfectant. If you ever had surgery, they put iodine all over your skin to kill anything that might be there. Second thing, way to control bacteria and keep them at bay, especially the bad ones, is a process called pasteurization. Notice that the first word is Pasteur. This is the French microbiologist that discovered these creatures and studied early about uh, bacteria. Pasteurization. This is basically a sterilization basically killing bacteria by heat. So when you pasteurize something, basically you cook it at high temperature and of course bacteria die at high temperatures. What things do we do with this? If you buy any milk in the United States, all milk is pasteurized, has been heated. That's why the milk can last two or three weeks sometimes in the refrigerator. The yogurt is pasteurized before they add the lactobacillus so that they can kill all other bacteria. Eggs, many of the eggs are also pasteurized. It's a slightly different process. It's not very high temperature, but it kills the bacteria on the surface of the shells. And of course, remember that when you cook your food, it kills bacteria. That's why when the water is contaminated, they tell you, boil the water. So, disinfectants, pasteurization, and finally, refrigeration. We rely on refrigerators and the low temperatures in a refrigerator. In a refrigerator, the temperature is 4 degrees Celsius. Not in the freezer, but in the refrigerator. 
that is around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature is low enough that prevents bacteria from reproducing. It does not kill bacteria. It does not kill bacteria, but any bacteria that might be in your food or anything that you put in the refrigerator basically does not increase in numbers. All right? That's why if you have leftovers, you always have some bacteria in those leftovers, so you put them in the refrigerator. If you leave the leftovers outside, they spoil, they get bad really fast. But in the refrigerator, they can last a day, two days, a week, because it prevents bacteria from dividing. And not only that, it prevents bacteria from doing any metabolic activity. Remember that the low temperature slows down all the chemical reactions. Remember, low temperatures, low kinetic energy, slows down all chemical reactions, including cellular respiration, including everything. So basically the bacteria are kind of unable to do anything. All right? So this is the main job of refrigeration. It does not kill, but uh, lowers the metabolic rate of anything that is in your food and prevents them from growing, dividing, or just from doing uh, cellular respiration. So with this, I hope you have a better understanding of bacteria around you. And in class, we'll talk a little bit more about how good bacteria are in our body. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Please write down the questions so we have something good to talk about that you care about. I hope this helps. Thank you for listening.